2 Corinthians chapter number 11 is where we will be. Everyone's had a good afternoon. Was able to get your nap out if you needed a nap. If you didn't get your nap out, just act like it for a few minutes. You can go home and go to bed here shortly. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And we'll start a reading in verse number 1. So when you found your place there, let's all stand together. Oh, can and will. And 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. We'll read down through, through, uh, through a few verses. We'll skip and we'll read uh, a few more. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Verse number 1, the Bible says, We are good to God a little in my folly and indeed bear with me for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Verse 4 says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, if ye, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with it. Now, he said, be careful, he said, because I have presented you in the way that I would like for you to be presented. I've showed you in the word how you are to be. So but be very, very careful when they come with another gospel because it can get in your mind and it can change you. Now skip down with me in verse number 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed, watch this, into an angel of light. Therefore, it is a no great thing if he ministers also, if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You can be seated this evening. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, we'll be looking back in the topic in which we started last week. And we started last week the series on the mind. And we, we took last week and we looked at the sweet promise, Brother Peter, that was given to us in the 23rd Psalm that our God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our, our enemies. And we know that it's a table prepared for us to commune with God, just the two of us. No one else is invited to that table unless we bring them into that table. We must set our minds on that great truth to help us through the times that we allow the adversary to play with and infiltrate our mind with his agenda. Looking at the text this evening, we find that his agenda is being made through uh, through some of his um, ministers of darkness um, transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness. He was even transformed, the Bible says, into a, 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 an angel of light. And so when we look at that this evening, as we begin talking about that in these verses, uh, the fact that I, I want us to understand how and when the adversary attacks our minds, it usually comes by way of of quiet suggestions. He's very uh, um, suggestive, but it's quietly that it enters our mind. He doesn't approach us, with, Brother Matt, with flashing lights. Saying, hey, look at me. I'm coming to try and corrupt you. Hey, look over here. I'm going to mess with your mind. No, it doesn't happen that way. That's not the way God does things, or Satan does things. And he does things very subtly, like we saw in the, uh, in the, in the text here this evening. He doesn't approach that way. He approaches subtly. So, maybe it's through someone that we know, or that we've known for a while, or maybe someone that you have just met. It may be through a soft word. 
It may be through an intriguing picture, a tune that always that is used to make you drop your guard. Maybe it comes by way of someone in agreement with a sin that you have or a problem that you may have with scripture that I don't like that. And then somebody comes up alongside you and says, yeah, I don't like that either. These things happen. But what happens when we have something to unify around, especially when it's something like that, something that isn't pertaining, to, something that's pertaining to a negative thought? Because would you agree that our mind mostly attracts negative thoughts? So when something negative comes into our mind, Brother Mike, it's easy for us to say, oh, I see that you don't like that verse either. I hate that verse. We're best friends. Yeah. Right? I've seen people who wouldn't even speak to each other on opposite sides of the church. All of a sudden, one of them gets sideways, sideways with the pastor or one of his kids. The other one has an agenda like that too. They become bosom buddies. They're best friends all of a sudden, Miss Suzanne, because we have common ground now. And so we've got to be real careful because that's what happens. And very suddenly he enters into our mind. And, and we're going to look at that. He, we, we understand this evening. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But I feel impressed to say it right now. We understand that Satan is not omnipresent, right? Yeah. We understand that this evening. So whenever I say that Satan infiltrates our mind, it's not him sitting in my house tonight, sitting in your house tonight, sitting in your house tonight. Sitting. In, that's not what I'm talking about. But we do know that he is the prince of the power of the air so he can get anything that we look at. Where's my phone? Oh my goodness. He's there, right? He can plant those little seeds. Somebody on the phone, somebody in front of us can plant those little seeds. So understand when I say that tonight, a lot of it depends on me. A lot of it depends on me as to what happens within my mind. It does not take long before we get back in our mind again. Doesn't take long before he's back at our table. And this time he's not, Miss Jessica, he's not just sitting at our table now. He is actually reaching across saying, I need to swallow your water. He's drinking my water. He's taking my napkin and using my napkin. He has infiltrated my entire being at that point when I allow things like that to happen. So I want to talk for just a few minutes this evening on the subtlety of deception. The subtlety of deception that happens within our minds. Deception is so subtle, and it has to be. If someone looked at you eye to eye, Brother Mike and said, I'm going to change your mind about God right now. Your defense is up. You're like, mm, I know where I stand. That ain't happening. I'm going to change your mind about that scripture right now. Now, I know where I stand on that scripture. I'll change your mind about that King James Bible. Now, I know where I stand. Right? But, whenever things continually stop popping up, and knows where to put them, and knows where knows when you're weak, and knows where to put them. You start thinking, well, is, is that true? Is, is that true? The subtlety of deception. Let's pray this evening, ask God to help us, and open our minds this evening. This is what it's all about, the minds. And our, 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 they say a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a mind also is a terrible thing to get involved in. <laughs> it's tough to get inside there sometimes, all right? So the subtlety of deception. Mike, you pray for us. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you once again, Lord, for another opportunity here tonight. Father, we just pray now for wisdom, discernment, Lord, uh, concerning the scriptures here. God, I need your help. Hey, man, our text this evening is one that speaks of the subtlety of false teachers, demons, satan satanic ministers. We won't necessarily go that route tonight to turn this into uh, things, but I do want to um, show you scripturally how things can be twisted and thought and, and, and misconstrued within our minds uh, this evening. The purpose of this message in this series is how subtle the, uh, the seeds are planted, how subtle they're planted within our minds, and how they cause us so much stinking trouble. We, we've mentioned this before, that how I, I wish that I could get a garden to grow the way seeds do within my mind. 
man, we would we would feed the entire community in that way because it don't take much. And boom, here comes this tomato, and boom, there's that tomato, and this tomato pops up. Then you got a whole string of beans over here. They say you know you're overrun with all the seeds that have been planted within our our minds. So this evening, I want us to understand that when a seed is planted and not dealt with biblically, they grow into what becomes an overgrown, unmanageable thicket within our minds. The lethal, you think about this. If something goes through a thicket, it gets hung on about everything, does it not? You take it, you, you, you take an animal run through, you can tell that an animal has run through that thicket because some of its hide, some of its fur has been left behind. Well, if that is the way our brains are and our minds run those two different things, brains and mind, I'll probably make that mistake a few times. But if that's the way our minds are, it is that they're such engulfed in that, in that big thicket, then anything that goes in there is going to get caught up. Anything that goes in there is going to get caught up, and then it's going to begin to grow. It's going to begin to become a problem as well. If we don't deal with it, biblically they become stumbling blocks, and those will eventually ruin our relationships, not only with each other, but ultimately it'll, uh, it's, it ruins the relationship we have with God. These ideas are placed in our minds, and they smother out tend to smother out good, sound truth and sound doctrine. We end up giving way to those thoughts that are placed within our mind by the adversary rather than hope of the Savior. Would you agree with me on that this evening that God's given us a promise? A promise that we don't have to be a slave to that stuff anymore. We, we, we don't have to give way to, to, to our minds. We don't have to give way to the negative things in life. But we can trust in God. We can give it to Him. And He'll take care of all that. Would you agree that that's, that's my Savior tonight we're talking about? Well, the problem with that is, is most of the time we don't do that. And in not doing that, Brother Matt, what we do is we open up the door. Satan gets his little toehold in there. And next thing you know... We're wondering, God, where are you? And we run him off. We, we, we basically kicked him out because we enjoyed this idea and this idea and this thought process and thought, well, let me see if I can. Hey, look, guys, I'm just going to be honest with you. <clears throat> and I think my pastor may have said it when he was preaching here uh, several weeks ago. You, you can find anything you want to right here. You can find anything. My goodness, they are, they are finding, supposedly in the Bible, out of context, obviously completely out of context. We'll look how Satan uses it later. But that it's okay to murder babies. They're finding that. Then they're, they're giving you a scripture saying, oh, God's okay with that. No, God's not. It's a human life. God's right. not. It's shed blood, innocent blood, right? He, he, that he, he don't go for that. They're finding that. They're finding now, Brother Matt, that it's okay to cheat on your wife. Yeah, that's my thought. Really? Okay to get drunk. It's okay to it's okay to booze it up. It's okay to lay out of church and go boozing. What? Where, where, where is that in Scripture? Please show me where that stuff is in Scripture. But people will find something, yank it completely out of context, and, and they'll, they'll go with it. And that's what's happening with these false teachers and that's being talked about here in the book of 2 Corinthians. So tonight, uh, whenever those things start being placed in our mind, it's, it, man, I'm going to tell you, if somebody tells me that I can do all the things that I used to do, Brother Mike, before salvation, and still be saved and still go to heaven and still please the Lord, sign me up. Not now. I've done live long enough. I don't want that mess. I'm thankful, man. That was it. Look, it, it, there is pleasure in sin for a season, right? The Bible says that there, there is fun in that, but there's a payday that has to happen, right. and, and, and I, I'm done with the paydays. And people don't realize that a lot of times is the things that have to happen. So they think, oh, I've got my fireproof insurance. I'm good. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's the little things that start getting in our minds and start confusing us along the way. So mostly we battle in our minds with, the, with our feelings that are dictated by our minds. It comes down to what we think someone meant or what we think someone, or what we feel like someone's agenda was. Has anybody ever been wrong? No. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. You bunch of saints, you never been wrong before in your life. I understand. Well, let me tell you what it's like to be wrong, okay? 
because I've been that way a many, a many a time. Your pastor, you, yeah, I know it's hard to believe. It really is. But I've misread the way somebody acted towards me. I've misread the way someone spoke to me. I misread two folks standing on the other side of the room laughing and chuckling and having a good time and think they're talking about me. Anybody else ever been there? I've misread and I've allowed things that have happened years and years and years in the past. Truth be known, and I'll go ahead and get there. Truth be known tonight, if we were to go back to the day that this supposed offense happened to us, it didn't happen the way we remember it. How you know what you fabricated within your mind over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We understand what we fabricated in our mind. We don't remember truthfully, Brother Matt. What happened? Y'all do you realize that if me and Brother Peter got a problem with one another, there's going to be three sides to the story? Yeah, there's going to be my side, there's going to be his side, and then there'll be the truth of what happened. Right? No, he's not going to lie. No, I'm not going to lie, but I'm definitely going to tell it to paint it in the light of me looking better. And he's going to do the same. Unintentionally. So, in doing that for so long, I got, man, I got so much stuff we got to get to. But our minds. You can be told something over and over and over, even within your own mind, and start to believe it. You can start to believe knowing it's a lie. Right? You know that when you start telling this thing over and over and over and over, then it's a lie. But eventually, you're thinking, well, did it happen? By the way, it's funny. We had, a, had an incident today at lunch. Not an incident, but I had a conversation today at lunch. And somebody said, no, you did this. And that person said, I know I didn't do that. They said, uh -huh, you did this and this and this. They said, no, ma'am, no, sir, I did not. I know for a fact I did. But the other person had had it in their mind that this had happened and thought, would have fought you to the death over it. I mean, I'm talking, all, yes, you did. We can tell ourselves things. Things can happen within our minds that we feel like are True, and that's where I'm getting tonight with these uh, deceivers and the subtlety of deception. Philippians 4 8 says, Find finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Then at the end of that verse, he says, Think on these things. We've got to think on whatever things are true, not whatever things we think are true or whatever things we want to be true. We have to think on whatsoever things are true. In our minds to rob us of relationships in our lives. Sometimes the attacks are so subtle that we don't even recognize them. Don't even recognize that it's happened. A word here, a phrase there. These things tend to stay with us and continually be brought up into our minds. Remember, Satan, like I said earlier, is not omnipresent. We do know that he is the prince of power of the air, though. And it isn't, he, he's not always sitting with you, but he's always got somebody trying to mess with you. Every time we pick this stupid little thing up right here, I remember mean, Mike Brown, we're talking about this this morning. Unfortunately, the day and time we live in, it's about a necessary evil. Not all the social media, but the phone and the texting and things of that nature. Every time we ask you a question, you don't, please don't answer this because I know the answer. Have you ever been sideways with somebody? It seems like every time you turn on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever one of them social media things are, there they are. Every stinking time. But Peter, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> He, he's he, he's a yeah. he's a he's a social media guru. <laughs> he's like I don't know. No, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But it seems like every time you turn it on, there they are. Every time pops up, and here you are angry, and they're over here having such a great time, and you're just like I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Now we would never do that because we're Christians. We just do it on the inside. We don't do it outside where anybody can condemn us, right? 
But he knows. He knows what will cause us to go off the cliff. And he knows exactly. I know what I'm talking about. Maybe it just happened to me. But it seemed like every time I turned on social media, there was something. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Lord, help me. God, help me. No. And you know, you know what stupid me said? Lord, help me not see that mess no more. You know what Holy Ghost said? Turn it off then. Ha <laughs> ha! Boy, what an idea! But we don't do that, Brother Matt. You know why we don't do that? Because we're nosy. We're busybody. We want to know what are they doing? What are they doing? What is he doing? What did she say? Are they talking about me? Who cares if they're talking about us? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. But the attacks do come suddenly. And remember, like I said, things that we see, hear, and read can be used by the adversary. If we allow them to destroy uh, relationships with our brethren, it can ultimately ruin our relationship with God because I promise you something right now. If we ain't right this way, we ain't right that way. Right. Repeat, if we ain't right this way, we ain't right that way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And that's the truth of the matter. So you say, you say, well, Pastor, what, what do I need to do? You need to get right. Yes, yes, indeed. Maybe, oh my goodness, no, Pastor, I can't do that. Maybe I need to go to somebody and say, hey, is there a problem? I, want, I, this, I feel like it may not be bothering you, Brother Mike Brown, but me, it is hindering my relationship with God. And buddy, I just want you to know I love you. I'm sorry if I've offended you. I'm sorry if I've done anything. Is there anything that I need to get right about? And if he's right with God, he'll say, you know what's been bothering me? Is you said, di, di, di. And I'm going to say, brother, I don't remember saying that, but I'm sorry. Or I can say, yeah, I said that because you, no, I'm just being. <laughs> I remember saying that because you are. No, 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 don't do that. But that's what we need to do. But why don't, why don't we do that, Miss Cat? Oh, what was that word? Pride. Pride. You, you been in my notes? All right. But we don't do that because of our pride. And, Brother Mike Brown, you know what? I can't be a martyr if you're not mad at me no more. That's exactly right. I want to wear it like a badge. Oh, I can't come over there because, well, you know what happened so long ago. Who cares what happened so long ago? My goodness. Are we building birdhouses or are we talking about souls? I'm not worried Brother Mike McPhail about what happened 50 years ago. You do realize, you talk to the Hatfields and McCoys there toward the end, they didn't have any idea what they were fighting about. No idea whatsoever. Why are we fighting? We hate them. Why? What did they do to you? We hate them. Right? That's all they'd say. We hate them. Why do you hate them? I just hate me a Hatfield. What? Why? What did they do to you? Well, old grandpappy said, what did they do to you? Nothing. Nothing. It's time to get it right, church. It's time to get it right. Hey, it may not even be somebody in here tonight. It may be somebody that listens or watches. They may need you to come to them. They may need to come to you. This may be somebody in California hears this. Go to them if you're hearing this. We need to get right. Why? Because God will never move in our lives if there's a filthy mess within them. And we can't do it, Brother Mike, because, oh no, what will people say? Y'all ready for this? I'm going to help you. Pastor going to help you tonight, okay? If my wife and I get in an argument at home and we're not down drag out, and I'm right, <laughs> it really happens. That's why I'm using this as an analogy. And I'm right. But to end it, I look at her and say, babe, I'm sorry. Let's just squash this. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? But you were right. So? You know the peace and harmony? Peace and harmony. Yeah, right? The peace and harmony is going to be around the house because I just said, let's squash this and be done. I'm sorry. Y'all know there's nobody sitting outside the house. Oh, you sissy, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> are they Jack? They ain't doing that, are they? No! There ain't nobody keeping tallies. 
But in our mind, are you going to lose? Who cares at the end of the day? If I've got to get right with you over something so I, my relationship with God is stronger, ah, no brainer, right? No brainer. I promise you, like I said, if we ain't right this way, we won't be that way. Our thoughts become difficult to decipher from time to time. They really do. We can get so engulfed in our thoughts that eventually the mind begins to believe that things are true. There's a phrase that I learned years and years ago, and in researching it, I don't know who said it. Joseph Goebbels could have said it. He was part of the Nazi leaders. Adolf Hitler is who I always heard that said it, but I don't know. He said it was part of the Nazi propaganda. I don't know who said it. Somebody said it somewhere along the line because I got the quote. All right? It's not mine. And the quote goes like this. If you kill a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will begin to believe it. I'd heard it in the sense that if you tell a lie, uh, tell a lie loud enough and long enough, that people will begin to believe it. Same principle, just a different kind of verbiage. So that's what one of them had said. And it's so true. It's so true that if you begin to tell the lie, it, people will eventually begin to believe it. Uh, this is the same trick that we play on ourselves. We allow a lie to get in and we continue to repeat it to ourselves. We continue, Brother Peter, to say, well, so-and-so cut their eyes at me at church the other day. So-and-so uh, whispered under their breath. Yeah, they probably had indigestion. Right? They probably, and you thought they were rolling their eyes at you. Right? Just give them a minute. All right? But when Mike, we don't do that, we start thinking in our mind, oh, 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 so-and-so, and we're at war, and we end up being the half of the and have filled in the and have no idea why we're mad at them. There are friendships in this world that have been lost for two, three, five, ten, twenty years over misunderstanding and lack of a big word, communication. We have to realize tonight, instead of allowing things to get into our minds and corrupt our minds, Brother Reggie, we just need to figure it out. Quit trying to figure it out in your mind and go to and get it done. But our minds are a crazy thing. Repetition makes things seem true, and the adversary knows that. So when you start looking at something that was posted by somebody that gets under your skin, as I said a moment ago, they'll start see, you'll start seeing that mess more and more and more. And then you start seeing something that is in agreement to what they are doing and what they've said. You might even look through and say, "How did Julie Brown hearted what she said? I can't believe her. <laughs> yeah, I cannot believe. She, she used to be my friend. I... How dare her heart somebody? What are we in middle school girls? You can't have but one friend. How dare you? You know what she done to me. You know what he done to me. And you're going to heart one of those pictures. Yeah, I thought it was a cute picture. Sorry. But what's happened? Now, now Julie don't like me in my mind because she hearted my adversary's picture. So now she and I can't get along. And then I saw Suzanne over there talking to her the other day, and they're probably talking about me. So now Suzanne's not my friend either. And now what I'm doing, Brother Matt, is when I come to church, because of how things have cultivated within my mind, I'm sitting over there like this wondering, does anybody even love me? Does anybody even like me? And then I go to my wife and I say, we just need to find somewhere else to go to church. Nobody loves us. Nobody wants us around. Nobody talks to me. Nobody's going to talk to me if you sit over here in the corner all day and pout. Listen, I'm not going to talk to you because I don't want you to bring me down with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're sitting over there and look like somebody just went over your dog when you pulled in the yard out here, but man, we ain't going to, we ain't, I might try to say, hey, how are you? But say, oh, no, we ain't going to talk. Right? But how did I get there? Miss Cat, how did I get there? By letting garbage within my mind and not handling it biblically. If a brother offend me, what are you supposed to do? Go to and him alone, right? 
How often does that happen? Not very often. Not very. You know what saves relationships? When that happens. Absolutely that saves relationships. Listen, I'm not saying that they're not real feelings. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the real hurt's not there. I get it, man. I get it. But sometimes the basis of your hurt is self-inflicted. Yes. It's self-inflicted. And it's not the way you remember it. We've got to be real careful. Real careful. So, I'm going to give you this and we'll, we'll, we'll move along. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted to say this. I know people right now that because of preconceived ideas they have in their head, they won't step foot in this church. Absolutely. Some of them have actually won't step foot in here because of something that has been said by someone within the doors and they've took and run with it in their minds. They have preconceived notions of who I am and what I am, Brother Mike. Oh, I can't go listen to him. He's da 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 well, I can't do that because his wife is ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. I won't go over there because the people that sit on the third row on the right side are pa-pa-pa-pa-pa. Yeah, y'all go ahead and count it out. One, two, three. That's right. Depends on how you look at it. <laughs> Peter Pitchfork, now he thought, I'm in the second row. <laughs> Not the third. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I won't go there because of that. I won't go there because they, they practice Pitchfork religion. <laughs> Remind me not to sit behind the tailors. <laughs> but they already got it in their mind yeah. as to how I am. And let me, I'm going to ask y'all a question this and I'm going to give you the answer. It's, it's, it, you, you wouldn't know. But do you know how many of those people, Brother Mike, have called me and said, Bo, I've heard this about you and I think this about you. Am I right? You know how many people have called me and asked me that? That's a goose egg. Nobody. I welcome it. Yeah. Oh, I heard, I heard this about you. I heard that you do. I heard that you only preach King James Bible. You're right. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's what I preach. Absolutely. Yep. I heard that you preach service. Oh, yeah, I do that. I do that. I, I hear you preach faithfulness. Yeah, I, do, I do that too. I do that too. I preach all that. You preach so many. Yep, yep, yep. I do that. I've been accused of so many things, Brother Peter, that I've never done, though. You know how many people have come to me about it? None. My pastor used to joke and say, I've been accused of everything under the sun except stealing a black baby and painting him white. <laughs> he said, but stick around, it might happen. <laughs> but it, 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 people have the idea in their mind that that pastor makes everybody do this under his thumb. That pastor does this. No, there is an order to the church that God has set up and there is a leadership order that is right with God but let me ask any of you in here have I ever chewed you out for not doing something that I've preached no will I ever not if I'm right in my head I won't and I won't you know why you're not mine you're God's. You're God's. My calling is to preach the word. To be the in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what I do. But they think you go over there, he's gonna make you do this. He's gonna make I don't make y'all do nothing. I preach the Bible. If God makes you but if he don't, Jack's happy about it. <laughs> That's right. He's excited. But you know how many people will call me? Probably none. Probably none. And that's sad because we're not handling things biblically. But rather, Miss Julie, what we're doing is we're allowing our minds to just run. And you know what it's doing? It's causing a hindrance with God. Amen. Listen, people don't come to me because I'm not approachable. But really, it just doesn't fit their agenda. They've been made their mind up that they're going to believe a lie. And if they come to me, they'll find out, you know what, he's really not that bad. I try not to be anyway. I, I guess, I mean, I could be a jerk, but what's the point? 
accepted. I don't like being, I don't like being hated. But they'll realize that, then, um, you know what? I was wrong about you. And then you've got to admit you were wrong. You ain't got to admit you was wrong to me. Hey, just come on. Let's have a good time, right? It only takes a moment to welcome the wrong thoughts. It only takes a moment to welcome the wrong ideas. Like I said earlier, quit blaming Satan for things that we do ourselves. Amen. I cause more damage to Bo than Satan will ever think about causing the Bo. I, I understand he's the cause of it. But it's my fault, Miss Jessica, when I harbor it. It's my fault. It's on me. You know, it's kind of like, well, I'm blaming, I'm blaming Satan because of all the stuff that I'm going through. I'm blaming Peter Taylor because of all the hurt that's in my life. That's like me saying, I'm blaming McDonald's because I'm fat. How does that work? It, it, McDonald's wasn't shoving it down my throat. I was willfully going over there and giving them too much money, Brother Tom, amen, and getting fat. But that's what we do. We always pass the buck, blame somebody else, blame somebody else, blame somebody that can't uh, defend themselves, blame somebody that's not around. Look with me in Second um, Corinthians, back there in our text, in chapter number 11. Look with me in verse number 14. Hold on tight, because we're going to finish this thing tonight, okay? We're getting into the message now. <laughs> Point number one this evening is I want you to see the deception. The deception that is played here in verse 14 and 15. Verse number 14 of 2 Corinthians 11 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. It is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end it shall be according to their work. Satan is the master at what we call the illusion of truth. Would you agree with me tonight? Has anybody ever been looking at something and thought, man, that looks truthful only to find out that it's a lie? Because the illusion was there. It was truthful. When, when you see something that you know to be false and could easily mark it as false, however, the more we hear about it, the more we see it, the more different things pop up. Uh, start questioning whether or not how I learned it to be true or not. We don't know whether it's a fact or not. I thought about Paul Revere's ride. He didn't ride nowhere. We learned that in school, didn't we? Paul Revere rode and said, there are people coming. Woo, 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 woo. No, he never crossed the river. He was the one that was responsible for the light. He didn't wait on the light. But that's not how we learned it, is it? You start studying history, you find out that he was captured. He didn't ride. There was two other guys that did the riding. Right fella, if I'm not mistaken, at least one of them was anyway. But you don't hear about those guys. We didn't learn it right. So here we are in our minds thinking, oh, well, that's not right, Pastor. How dare you say that? No, that's true history. We just didn't learn it properly. There's so many different things I could go through and we could talk about. We talked about George Washington and his wooden teeth, right? You learn that. We talked about George Washington and him chopping down a cherry tree. That never happened. These things never happened. But the tales that we learn, these fables and wives' tales, turn in to truths in our mind. Why? Because we hear it so much. That's the way the mind works. The more we hear it, those so-called facts from history that we've been told for so long that we've learned them to be true, yet when you look them up, we find out that they're falsehoods. Most of the time, these lies are brought to us very subtly. Subtly. Sub sub that word. Subtly. I say subtly. I know it's subtle. If they are brought in the light, then it's easy to debunk them, Brother Matt. That's why the adversary will not show his true color. Because his purpose is found in John 10.10. 10. Just write down the reference. It says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, Though I am come that they may have life and they may have might have it more abundantly. But Jesus says right here that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief is subtle and unassuming before they attack you. Many times the deception comes from one and one that appears to have our best interest at hand. 
These tend to be the ones who earn our trust so many times, maybe through a difficult time in our life. Maybe through um, something happening, they may provide you advice during a time that has just enough truth to it, Brother Matt, to make you say, oh, well, okay, they, they do love me. They do think about me. I think about people who get wrapped up in different <laughs> religions because they go through a terrible time in their life and somebody slides up right next to them and starts talking to them. They're like, oh, well, I don't really believe in what you believe, but you're nice to me. And then it starts infiltrating their minds. and so That's why it's always important, church, to love people where they're at. That's why it's always important, church, to not be so judgy. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, we can judge a righteous judgment. We've talked about that. I'm not telling you not to do that. But what I'm telling you tonight is instead of looking down our nose at people, you never know what they might be going through. You never know what they might need. Brother Peter, you never know. They might just need a friendly handshake. Mm -hmm. You never know. Brother Mike, they might just need somebody to say, you know what? I'm praying for you. Mm -hmm. You never know. And that could speak volumes because they've got it in their head that you're crazy. Y'all realize that tonight? They look, the world looks at you tonight and has got it in their mind that that crowd at the Hope Bible Baptist Church is crazy. Why? They come Sunday morning for Sunday school. Then they come in here on Sunday morning at 11, put money in a box, and let some dude yell at them for an hour. <laughs> then they go home. By the time they come back <laughs> Sunday night, they do it again. And then Wednesday? You do it again? Y'all crazy. Y'all have lost your ever loving minds to the world. But they've been trained to be that way. The deception in which this world has, has, has very subtly proven to them that they are right when in all actuality they're wrong. Maybe they come through a difficult time. The deception, but we also find not only the deception, but I want you to notice the dishonesty. And you say dishonesty and deception, yeah. Dishonest, deception is more pulling the wool over someone's eyes. Dishonesty is just without lying to you and how it affects us. Go with me to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4. And look in verse number 5. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 5 of Matthew 4, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, listen to Satan casting out, let me throw out some Bible here. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, with true scripture, and with proper contextual scripture, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan misused, misquoted, and took out of context the word here. In Psalm 91 is, where, is what he was quoting. But we find his dishonesty there. He took it out of context in Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. If you want to write that reference down. The Bible says, For he shall give the angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Satan is saying that God will protect you if you give me your life. Give me your life, friend, and God will protect you because he's a good God. That's what he's saying which is completely out of context to what that scripture's meaning. But what he's saying there is like, if you'll do this for him, come on, just give me your life. And see, that's what happens to us today. Do you think if he is willing to attack the Son of God, wouldn't he be sending somebody, Brother Matt, to attack us? Wouldn't he send somebody to get into our mind and say, oh, look, if you just do this, don't worry about it. He's a forgiving God. He'll forgive you for doing that. So just come on, come on, follow me over here, do this, do that. The dishonesty that follows. So Christ hits him back with Deuteronomy 6.16 where he says, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. 
if Jesus would have succumbed to Satan's advances, what would we have said about that? We'd have said, oh, he's weak. He was weak. Oh, he lost his faith. You know what we would say? We would say something of that sense, right? Oh, he was weak. He'd been there 40, 40 days and you know, he, he was fasting, hadn't had nothing. And here, so he was, he was weak and his faith was fading on him. Let me ask you a question. When Satan attacks us and we approve of his advances and we go that way, Miss Cat, what do we say about ourselves? Oh, I was mixed up. No. Your faith was small. No, you walked away from God. Right? It's tough when you're looking in the mirror sometimes, Brother Mike, to say these things. But truth of the matter is, whenever we do those things, we allow Him as foothold within our mind, then we became, we are weak, and our faith has, has fallen. So, what do we say when that happens? When thoughts have no validity to them whatsoever, they still plague us in our quiet time. To the point that whomever they are about become an enemy in our mind instead of just getting over them. You know the most important thing that will keep us from being sideways with one another? I said it a few moments ago. I'll say it again. Honest communication. Honest. Brother Peter, if you've got a problem with me, Brother Mike, if you had a problem with me, Brother Tom, any of you ladies, if anybody in this place had a problem with me, it would mean a whole lot more to me if you come to me and said, Pastor, I don't like the way that tie looks with that coat. <laughs> Brother Peter had no problem saying in Sunday school one day how much he didn't he disliked my ties. <laughs> and I pray, no, I'm, I'm over it. I'm over it. <laughs> let me let me I'm gonna give you a little story real quick. My pastor, <laughs> I may have even told this before, but JB was in a, um, we, we went out one morning to a, um, a, a, a pancake breakfast. The Kiwanis Club always had a pancake breakfast there in Ashburn. It was huge. I mean, I'm talking thousands and thousands of people go through. I can't imagine how many pancakes and sausage they made. So we go through there. Well, the photographer from the local uh, newspaper comes through, takes JB's picture sitting there eating a big old pancake. And it says, you know, Kiwanis Pancake Supper, blah, 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 blah. Jackson Redmond, you know, three or four years old, whatever he was at that time. Does the, I think he was three. You know, loving his pancakes. Put it on the front page of the hometown newspaper. Well, my pastor thought, I'm going to give him a nickname. Like we all would do, right? So they started, he started calling him, hey, what's up, pancakes? <laughs> Jamie was like, hey. This went on for a little bit of time. And finally, J.B. looked at me and he said, Dad, I don't like it when Preacher Mike calls me pancakes. I don't like it. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? He said, I don't know. I said, go to him. Go to him. There's a three-year-old boy going to the pastor telling him, I don't like it when you call me pancakes. I honestly didn't think he was going to do it. I thought, I'm going to have to say, Pastor, you know, don't do that no more. He don't, he don't like it. But after service one day, here's this little bitty boy, walks up to the platform, looks and says, Preacher Mike. He says, hey, pancakes. Hey, buddy, how are you? JB said, I don't like it when you call me pancakes. <laughs> His face dropped. He, he, he was like, buddy, I am so sorry. I will never, and to this day, he's never called him pancakes again. But there was a three-year-old little boy that had enough gumption to go to a grown man and tell him I don't like it but we got grown men that can't go to one another and say I don't like this or I don't agree with this amen what I'm saying tonight is instead of letting it infiltrate our mind brother Tom why don't you go to him and say hey pastor I don't like that I have, I've, had, I've had folk text me before and talk to me before. And I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Say, hey, you know, this, that, or the other. And that's, that's neither here nor there what it's about. Because it's probably between us. Hey, bro, this, 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 this. Yep, oh, absolutely. Hey, I appreciate it. I thank you for that. I know where, where you stand. I'd rather know where you stand 
and instead of you get behind closed doors, everybody else knows where you stand except me about me. Amen. Right? Communication, honest communication is what it's about. The enemy will use all kinds of devilish devices to get us. So he uses deception, he uses dishonesty, and he uses devices uh, uh, that will affect our mind, or in fact, whether a word, a post, a conversation, two people across the room talking, two people laughing, or someone mentioning something, walking by and just overhearing a word, not hearing the entire conversation, but we heard something and like, oh, they were talking about, quit being so stinking vain, they weren't talking about you. Right? If they were, I hope they have enough guts to come to you. That's kind of the way I've lived my life here recently. Is, hey, man, think what you want to about me. Say what you want to about me. If you don't say it, obviously you don't care enough to tell me. So why am I going to let your weak-backed mentality cause me to have problems? Can I get a witness right there? And if we would get to that point... That we don't let somebody that's too scared to say something to us bother us. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That'll fix our minds, y'all. That'll fix the church. That'll fix, it. That'll fix the world if we can get a hold of that. Understand this. He will kick you when you're down. Yeah. He tried it with Jesus. And why wouldn't he do it with us, right? There's three big of the biggest devices, if you'll go to 1 John chapter 2, that we'll find. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 16. Three of the biggest devices used by the adversary are found right here. <clears throat> Hope we're getting some help with this this evening. 1 John 2.16, the Bible says, For all that is in the world, what is it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, uh uh-oh, but it's of the world. These three worldly pleasures are what will be used to infiltrate our minds. This means that anything that can be used that our body naturally desires will be used. And wish for is a trap that leads to destruction. This pride of life, this harmful bragging, this boasting, this showmanship that causes us to have too much confidence in ourselves and look down on others can and will be used in our lives. All of these can be used to harm our mind. Think about how, how subtle he was in the garden with Eve. Think about that. Genesis 3, matter of fact, we'll talk about Genesis 3 this morning. Genesis 3 describes how the serpent beguiled Eve. He prompted her with the question, if God truly was good. Now, here's what he didn't do. He didn't trash her opinion of God. Do you know why? She had to shut him down right there. Oh no, that's my God. That's who I walk with. How dare you? But he started playing to her humanity. And started talking about, is God really good if he don't want you to know everything? I mean, you know, he's been a great God. He gave you all this. Oh man, look what he's done for you. But he don't want you to have that because he knows that you'll be like him. And I'm not telling you how to go get a bite of it, but why wouldn't you want something like that? Brother Matt, what are we going to do in that situation? You know, he's not trashed God. He's actually built God up and thought, well, okay, well, you know, I can be like him and he'll like that. He'll like that I'm like him because we can commune better if we're like each other. So let me go get a hold of that. He's very subtle in what he does. So are his ministers of darkness that come into our lives. So are those that those conversations happen. Those different devilish devices in which he uses. He never trashed God. He just only asked a question. Had he come in showing his true reason for messing with her and talked about how God didn't trust her? You, I can't believe that you're going to worship somebody that doesn't trust you, and you're going to do. She'd be like, whoa, 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 we walk with him in the cool of the morning. No, don't, don't come at me with like that. 
he had never got, but coming at her subtly, got her. Now, when that happens to us in our fallen state, what do you think our defiled mind will do? That was pre fall. He come to her and still got her <coughs> because of his subtlety, right? Yeah. So what do you think our defiled mind would do? You know what it does. You know what it does because you fight it as much as I do. Brother Mike, what happens when I've already got a little seed of thought in my mind about Matthew Tlodovich and then you walk by and say something? Oh, it grows. It grows quick. I think the worst. You can say, Pastor, you ought not be that way. I'm sorry. I'm just as much human as you are. I worry. I think. Oh no. What happened? Somebody mad. Somebody not mad. Somebody, are they never coming back? Right? God just don't want me to have any fun. He's trying to shelter me. He don't want me to do things that I like. That's not the case at all. Not the case at all. Never in the Bible does He tell you not to enjoy your life. Never does it. But there are some things that we should not do anymore. There are things that He does command that we stay away from. But we think the worst. We start thinking. Isn't that ultimately the conclusion we come to our mind is the worst case scenario? Always. And we go, we go zero to a hundred. I mean, the quickest thing on earth is a mind that races. Amen. Because as soon as something, that little seed gets planted in there, boom, I'm already, I'm already killing somebody before, it's, before, before this thought's over with. Amen right there. And it turns out to be nothing a lot of times, Brother Matt. But it happens to the best of us. Like I said last week, Satan... Satan is seeking whom he may devour. He's using these devilish devices in order to do that. But the thing in it that he's using those devilish devices, he's seeking whom he may devour. Remember, we don't have to be that sick wildebeest. We don't have to be that one that's weak. We don't have to be that one that's malnourished. We don't have to be the one that's falling behind. We don't have to be the one that's always in the rear of the pack wondering why we're going so fast. Wondering why y'all just slow down. We don't have to be that one. When he seeks whom he may devour, he's coming after the easiest one to get. He's coming after the one that he can grab hold to. She can grab hold of anything that falls behind. It could be just a little cub and she will grab hold of that thing because it's something and that's all. He can take care of one. That's one less he's got to worry about. Every one that he can take out and sideline, that's one less he's got to worry about. So whom he may devour, he's seeking, use those devilish devices to corrupt the minds that we may become like that sick wildebeest or that, that young that's easy pickings for the adversary. Beware of the subtlety of deception. He wants to kill your relationship with God. Yes. And listen, I'm telling you, he isn't general about it. Right. Not in the long run. He may be at first, but at the end of the day, he sets snares that will capture us. And before long, we end up doing his will for him. We corrupt ourselves. It can sometimes be difficult to recognize the enemy and, and their voice. Just as he was with Eve, he is constantly prowling and sending up those subtle hints for our minds to grab hold to. And you know what? We don't grab hold of all of them, hallelujah. But we grab hold of one. He grabs hold of another. Sends up another. And next thing you know, it continues to grow. When these things hit our minds, we must stop and do what Christ did. Deny the lies and combat them with truth. Little Mike Brown, what bothers my mind the most are lies. You know how I know that? Because they're not of God. They're not of God. 
things that bother me, things that uh, cause me pain, things that cause me hurt, things that cause me to dislike a brother or dislike a sister, things that do that, simply not of God. So I know that I need to deny the lies and come back to the truth. Don't entertain the thoughts, guys. God has never, nor will He ever, place a negative thought within your mind. That's not happened. Well, if He did, then He would be causing us to stumble. Mm -hmm. And why would my God ever want His children to stumble? Brother Mike, He doesn't. This is not... He don't want us to stumble. So he's not going to put something in my mind or Mike McPhail that might cause me to stumble. Because if it does, it hinders my relationship with him. And he don't want that to happen. So I ask you this evening. Have you ever felt the subtlety of deception? If it's there, if these negative thoughts, if these wrong thoughts are in our mind, if these things are within our mind, Brother Matt, guess where it came from? adversary his ministers of darkness and yours truly I've done it to myself brother Peter you've done it to you I'm not your enemy but sometimes I'm my worst enemy it's about eyes closed tonight